Welcome to the Little RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray. Um, today, we're going to be reviewing some very new and very classic stuff. So, Power Mage by Hondo Jinx. Narrated by Andrea Parsnow, with a book length of 7 hours and 50 minutes. His name was Brawley Hayes. And if you'd seen him standing there, tall and wiry in a t-shirt, jeans, and cowboy boots, watching the Key West street performers as the sun melted into the horizon, you could never have guessed that 24 hours later, he'd be the subject of an international manhunt that would change the world forever. Brawley grinned as the skinny calico jumped back and forth through a golden hoop held by her trainer, a red-faced man in a battered top hat, Hawaiian shorts, and a baggy t-shirt that read The Cat Wizard. Good girl, Callie, the cat wizard said, proving that he was better at training cats and naming them. He swept the top hat from his head and gestured toward a pair of ladders with a length of clothesline stretched between them. Callie climbed the ladder, delighting the crowd. That's when the trouble started. I'm going to admit that, that Honda Jenks has quickly become one of my go-to reads. Uh, coupling his pen with Andrea Parsnow so long ago, I mean, it's, it's been a number of books now, makes, it was a pure genius move, makes this a must-listen type of book. Um, I kind of fell in love with Jinx's style uh, in his Dan the Barbarian series because that's the only series I can listen to him with because that's the only series he put out on sound. But I really enjoyed that series a lot. Um, and that was kind of a facetious version of Robert E. Howard is updated with Bob Guccione, Guccione's, Guccione's? Bob Guccione's uh, sensibilities, you know, as in the harem section. And for you guys that don't know, Bob Guccione used to own Penthouse? Yeah, because Larry Flint uh, owned Hustler. So yeah, Bob Guccione was Penthouse, um, <clears throat> which was a very naughty magazine. Uh, Power Mage is more of a modern Louis L'Amour take, because this is a Western any way you slice it, if they, if they were packing heat uh, it, without anything else, it would be a Western. It would just be an updated Western. Um, it, is, it is Louis L'Amour with the Cinemax-styled storytelling added for flavor. Uh, the difference here is instead of guns, the players actually have something called psionics, uh, which is mental powers, where you move things with your mind, you read minds, you you see the future, you heal your body, you, you do all kinds of craziness, okay? Um, but but uh, that's that, that's the way it works. It, no guns, psionics. Uh, and it's a smart way to differentiate him, this from his Barbarian series, um, because there's no magic, and it's still hardcore, um, and... It just it it's not a magic fantasy world, uh, so you know it's not the gamelet that you're expecting, um, because it, it really doesn't have a fantasy flavor. It's more it's modern world, it's up to date, um, and it doesn't have magic. It's got psionics, which you could argue well that's just a different form of magic, but it's not. It's mental power. So anyway. Um, this is game lit. Brawley does progress in power and so on and so forth. It's just a light game lit book. Um, the story itself is pretty fast and it actually pulls no punches. The only issue I have is the way the book starts off with Brawley saving a cat. Now, honestly, cats are great swimmers. Yeah. Uh, you know, most people don't realize that, but like cats really do swim. They can swim. They're great swimmers. Um, and in fact, tigers are great, great swimmers. Tigers love to swim. Um, but anyway, um, I didn't really see any reason for him to emphasize, em, empathize, not emphasize, but empathize um, with the cat's plight, other than as a MacGuffin to you know get things going. Uh, past that pretty piece of publishing. The story flows pretty well, uh, has great characters, intriguing premise, and it rocks out in a really good start. The setup is pretty cool, too, uh, as there are characters that we only see for like one or two brief scenes, uh, and then that you know like later on they're going to pop up as bigger players in the future. Uh, I think my favorite character <laughs> is Sage. Uh, Smart Chicks is sexy. Oh, yeah. Uh, 
but I absolutely cannot wait for the rest of the series to hit. Um, and I know there's at least one other person that's going to be added to the harem. Uh, I, I, I should say, I know there's one person that I know will be added to the harem later uh, without ever writing, reading the other books yet, because I just listened, and this is book one in the series. Um, I know who that one is going to be. It's just, there's just no doubt about it. Um, now, there's a lot of stuff I could go into, and I don't want to keep these these reviews kind of short, but basically Brawley is just some guy from Texas who has a feeling he should go to Florida and kind of just see what happens. And he ends up going down past the keys and all that stuff and getting to this little place where something happens and it awakens his psionic abilities. Um, he is kind of helped out by a girl with purple hair, which is kind of shaved on one side. Um, and she helps him unlock his powers. Uh, because he finds out he's got psionic powers. Now, it's not a spoiler. It happens right in the beginning of the book. So he ends up running afoul of the psionic mafia. I know. I don't know. But anyway, um, from that point forth, the, the, the story really picks up speed really fast. And it really starts moving and it just it just never stops. Like once it gets going, it's just rolling along. Um, and you know, like I say, it's got the naughty bits in it. So if you like sex scenes, if you like harems, this is it for you. If you don't like them, you can skip those parts, but they're there. Um, but the book is pretty slick, and and I think Brawley is probably one of the better fleshed out characters. As much as I like Dan, Dan was just the barbarian, and then that's that played well. Brawley's a little bit more dimensional than, than Dan. You know, Dan was meant to be, you know, the standard Conan-type barbarian. Uh, <clears throat> so, Brawley has, like, elements of, like, Clint Eastwood and John Wayne, uh, you know, Lee Van Cleef, uh, you know, all these people from the West years ago he, he, it's the smattering of the wild bunch uh, just as much as it is good the bad and the ugly um in here uh you know for for the western feel and <clears throat> you know you don't really see these kind of characters a lot today you know he, he's just he's a bronco busting guy and you know he's he's slick he's smart and he he He's a man's man. I think that's probably the most important thing about it is um, Brawley is a man's man. Uh, he doesn't stand for crap, and if he tells you something, he means it. And if he tells you he's giving you one chance and you blow it, then you blew it. And there won't be a second chance. And that's one of the things I like about it. The characterization is really, really well done. Um on the narration side, Andrea is in danger of being burned at the stake for her work here uh, because it is pure magic, which is ironic because this is a book with no magic. Um, and I can only think that witchcraft is utterly responsible for this event. Um, no fuggle, that's right, and that's a real term, fuggle, um, could ever do what she does without the aid of some mystical information. In information? Oh my gosh. You can tell I'm getting tired, folks. Been up since five and it's getting late now. I'm getting a little, getting a little bleary-eyed. Uh, <clears throat> mystical intervention. Um, Andrea is really amazing, and I love that she literally narrated the book in Brawley's voice, with the exception of the times that it actually goes over to a couple of the other ladies here or there. Um, but she does it in Brawley's voice rather than reverting to her own when you know when he's not speaking. Uh, you know, because I'd have been like, you know, okay, uh, Brawley went to the door. He, he saw that Sage had left her panties on the floor. He bent over to pick them up to put them in the basket, because he's a man that takes care of business. And he said, Oh, yeah, Sage, I found your underpants on the floor. And then he goes back to my voice. Andrea doesn't do that. She does Brawley's voice the entire time, or at least makes it sound to that degree, like, you know, Brawley's the one telling the story, and then she has him talk. Um, and she does that with another book, Swing Shift. Really brilliant. And, and I don't know what I like better, because I, I also reviewed uh, Harmon Cooper's book, Death's Mantle, and in that one, she doesn't do this. She just straight-up narrates, so she plays Lucian. She's Lucian, and when she's narrating, 
she's Andrea doing her her narration voice. And I love that because I, I just listened to Swing Shift in this book, and I thought, wow, um, I really like what she did here. That was really smart. Really worked well. And then I heard her do it the other way, and I thought, damn, I miss this because it's so good. And and that's just that's just the way it is. Um, she is just incredible and amazing. Um, and there's some serious dedication uh, going on here. Just just it's just another reason, you know. If she can do that, um, that's why I'm impressed with her every single time I listen to her. You know, another book of hers. You know, every time I hear her tell me a story, it's a new way of her telling a story. I don't know how you can do that after you've narrated 30 books or 40 books or 50 books, whatever number of books she's narrated. And, you know, always making it new, always making it fresh, and always thinking about ways of getting better. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, you know, I just, Andrea is awesome. That's all I can say. I wish I had four hands so I could give her four thumbs up. Uh, my final score on this is 8.4 stars. Great beginning novel with tons of potential. I can't wait to see what's going on next. So, Dark Lord Burt mm -hmm, by Chris Fox, narrated by James Gillies, with a book length of 5 hours and 22 minutes. Burt trudged up the steep ridge, swaying briefly as the wind caught his oversized pack. He wasn't very strong, and he wasn't very fast. But that was sort of expected when you were a goblin. Not a full wog rider or a spear thrower or even a G-biter. No, Bert was the lowest of the low. He was just a one-hit-point goblin, so low that adventurers couldn't even see him, since he counted as a critter, like a rabbit or one of those cute little owls. But Bert had one advantage, an advantage that he would use to outsmart the village elders and even his mum. An advantage he'd cultivated from the very weakness that caused the bigger goblins to laugh at him. He smiled wickedly and reveled in his own power. Bert Smart. Dark Lord Bert is a cute but short little romp into the world of a minor goblin that is nestled well within the goblin horde. Um, there's a lot of things that go on with Bert, that's the name of the goblin, uh, that I think are important, and you know, you catch them on really quick as to what's going on. But basically, um, as a goblin, the more goblins that are around you, the less intelligent you become. Like Bert is really smart when he is nowhere near his relatives, but the minute he gets close to him, his head starts to hurt. It's hard for him to think. He can't um, string together great ideas anymore, uh, and it just—it's very obvious that the the group think overwhelms the individual and so you know where Bert is actually pretty smart because he he gets away from the others he can't use that to his advantage the way he really should um, the story I must say is a little bit light on game aspects although I will say it once and I have said it a thousand times before I only need enough to know that it's, it's got enough information there that it qualifies as game lit. Um, the game elements are really used really well in the book. Uh, the, the ones that are there, you know, we're not, it's like I say, it's not heavy. It's not overwhelming, but there are gaming elements and I think they work pretty well. Uh, <clears throat> so let me just give you a short, brief synopsis. This is going to be a brief review because it's a short book. Um, and, it, and it's a cute little book, but that's just the way it is. Um, the book details how one insignificant goblin rises from being a nothing uh, to becoming a dark lord, which is just what the title suggests. As I said, the story is cute and has funny moments, and I think Bert is actually pretty well crafted. Some bits really nailed it, such as all the wizards, you know, the, all these wizards kind of show up to claim a territory that Bert cleared out, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I think it's worth the time to take to listen to it. Um, it is funny. It, it's also a cutesy little story. Um, but it, there's nothing wrong with that. I, I've been accused of writing cutesy little stories too some, sometimes. So it, it, it's just a silly little thing. Um, and it won't cut into your listening time because it's only like five hours long. So, you know, give it a shot and enjoy it because it, it is it, it is worth the time and effort that you're going to get into this book. The book's not deep, but it's not meant to be, you know, of great depth. It's just a romp and silliness. Um, you know, 
and when I say this, what what is it that you know struck me as as being worthy to make you come into it? There are characters in the book, um, like like a an archer who's cursed that he can only shoot people in the nuts, let's just say in the private areas, um, with his arrows. No matter how he aims, where he aims, it's just going to hit them in one spot. Um, that was funny. Uh, that was really funny to me. And, you know, Bert does some silliness talking to a snail, uh, things like that, getting in and having to clear out an undead horde all by himself. It's just really worth your time, but it's just not overly heavy with gaming mechanics. Just be aware of that. Um, Gillies also adds the humor with his reading style, uh, and he really gets Bert's voice just right. Um, his proper English voice fits the story so well, it kind of felt like Mr. French was reading to me. Um, he has a very pleasant tone uh, to his voice that's almost kind of hypnotic, and I have to wonder if I wasn't hypnotized as I listened. My final score, like I say, it's a short book, a uh, short story, so I'm going to keep this review brief. Um, but, but it is 7.8 stars. I think that it, it's a very light game lit that's infused with humor and characters that will keep you posted. Um, as I've said before, with uh, like things like Noobtown, uh, that book, or Eric Uglin's <coughs> Good Guys, uh, those books have like a, a very strong humorous turn to them and how they do things and how things are dealt with. Here, the humor is is just kind of light and fluffy, and it, it doesn't always like knock you off your feet. But you, you'll go, "Huh, I get it." It's almost like a dad joke sometimes, uh, but it still it still comes up. It's just not to the guffaw that you get from Bajalor, you know, in in Noobtown doing something. Um, so you know, it, it 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 is funny. It just is not like ha 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 ha. It's kind of like ha. Huh. That was kind of good. So, you know, 7.8 stars, light game lit. Keeps you interested. I, you know, and I, I, I'm waiting for the next book to come out. So we'll see how things go. Uh, I'm hoping it gets to be a little bit longer, though. So, Mr. Fox, if you're listening, make them a, a little bit longer. Because uh, as much as I like short stories, uh, I think that Bert needs a little bit more expanse to his universe. But the book is good. So, we're going to review, at this moment, The Village of Noobtown. Just so you know. <clears throat> this book is written by Ryan Rimmel, narrated by Jonathan McLean, which is part of the uh, Noobtown series. This is book two. And has a book length of 13 hours and 43 minutes. The cold, stagnant air blasted into my face from the unknown darkness that threatened to drink my soul. My hand roughly scraped flint and tinder, trying unsuccessfully to get my lone remaining torch lit. I had started with three, but torches didn't last nearly as long as they claimed, especially when you were located deep underground hunting for monsters. Focus, dum-dum, Shart thought at me. He had the ability to see in the dark and liked to point out all the darkest spots in the underground. It amused him. I heard the skittering again. Grumbling, I concentrated. This time, the spray of sparks mostly hit the torch and it caught, suddenly giving me another precious few moments of light. That's when I saw the creature. A Rottweiler-sized rat snarled and lunged at me. So... Right off the bat, I'm going to just say, uh, book two upholds the great start the book one began. There is literally no sophomore slump here at all. I mean, not even remotely close. In fact, this is kind of like the sophomore pump, which I've done uh, in high school. Anyway, um, I want to tell you that this is like really one of those rare books that is absolutely 100% consistently funny. Um, Rimmel not only pens a very clever tale... But his humor is incessant and always, I mean, always on point. Um, I never heard a single groaner or thought that a joke fell flat. Uh, even when it was supposed to fall flat, I thought, boy, that was probably funnier than jokes that, you know, people that think they're funny say and they bomb horribly. I mean, I think he just really did a great job. And I mean that, like, 
not even when it came to the fecking Puma Forest. Um, there were, were, were a lot of Puma jokes. Um, and, and let me just say in comedy, like three is the magic number uh, for jokes. Like after the third reference, you're supposed to kind of step away and let the joke go. Uh, Rimmel takes that belief and he just beats the hell out of it. I mean, just absolutely just, you know, with the, the fecking Puma forest, it, it's, it's just one of those things where, um, I got to watch out for these fecking Pumas. Okay. Anyway, uh, the fecking Puma jokes were everywhere. And I mean, everywhere, but he takes the joke to like this entirely new level. Um, so even where there's a point where he's given a quest to kill 50 fecking Pumas. And, and anyway, um, it's not exactly what he thinks it is. So it's just fecking brilliant stuff. Um, so I just have to say, I, I think this is like really good. Now, Jim returns. So let me go back into the book now. Jim sort of returns and finds that his town is up and running. And his only... The problem is, is that that's just a single step in this big journey that forces him to walk on hot coals across a thousand miles. Um, Jim, fortunately, does get some help. Um, although it's unwanted help, it's forced upon him. Um, he gets a new pet or a pal or a whatever you want to call it in the form of a badger. Uh, the badger is probably one of the funniest additions to the book. Uh, I, I think that uh, he... he it, it, there's just parts to the, the badger that I just I just rolled every time I heard him talk or when he would make a comment. Uh, the the badgers are riot. That's just all I can say. I, I think that Rimmel is totally an amazing writer uh, and they can tell a great story, but he also infuses it with with humor, and that's rare. I think the only other person I know right now who does it just as well. And I'm, I don't mean to discount like Dakota Kraut, but his his jokes are kind of like the punny kind of jokes, and like. Uh, Eric Ugland and and Rimmel kind of have an expansive kind of thing because they can do this kind of joke, that kind of joke. They riff on different things. And those two guys really, like, I don't know if it's just I have a, a sense of humor geared toward the kind of stories they tell, but I absolutely love, like, Ugland stuff and Rimmel's. And I, could, I could listen to them all day uh, because I find myself laughing like an idiot which is normal. I guess if I laugh, it's laughing like an idiot. Uh, at least that's what my dad would always say. Anyway, th this is this is a fresh and fun take on town building that you don't want to miss and you don't ever see. Um, I, I think I just did a, a, a review not too long ago about like you know town building, so on and so forth with God of Gnomes. And, and that was more of a town building um, based off of like the original World of Warcraft where you would have the orcs or the elves or the humans build up their settlement and so on and so forth. And here, uh, you know, and they would do it from afar. Like they didn't interact with their people. They didn't do this here. Jim is right in the thick of it. He's in the middle of stuff. He is down and dirty and he is suffering every single second that he can. I mean, and, and he doesn't want to, but he suffers, uh, especially, especially when he goes through the fecking Puma forest. Yes. <laughs> Fucking Pumas. Anyway, um, if I ever get to read, I'm sorry, if I ever get to write, let me just put it like this. If I get to write a comedy-laden novel, and I do like to write some stupid, funny, kind of silly stories, um, and if I do get to write that comedy-laden novel, and it would be African... See, I can't even tell a joke. See, if I, th th this is the joke. If I were to write a comedy-laden novel, it would be African... See, I can't do it. It would be European, not African, because it's 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 a riff on the Monty Python swallows carrying coconuts. Is it African or European? And I, I got it backwards, and so I can't say it. So my joke just went down the toilet. But if I did write a comedy novel, I fully intend to get hold of Jonathan McLean to have him narrate it for me. Um, there are, are narrators whom I absolutely adore and love, and I think that they are the greatest narrators in the world. Uh, Jeff Hayes, uh, you know, um, Andrea Parsnow, uh, j just to name those two. I mean, I don't want to go into a great, great big rigmarole over who's fantastic and who's not. And it's not fair because there's so many people in SBT and outside of SBT, like Annalise Rennie and, you know, 
Armin Taylor and you know I, I try not to go into all that but the fact is Rimmel Rimmel is perhaps one of the most nuanced readers of funny business I've ever heard. Um, he uses every vocal tool he has to elevate the power of the jokes that Rimmel has written. His inflection, characterization, pacing, accents. He takes the story, makes it sound like something Chappelle, Williams, or Dangerfield um, had all come together to write. I mean, you know, th th that's just the brilliance of how he does it. I mean, he literally works without a rim shot, but ting, you know, he, he doesn't have that. And I should. It, I have fecking pumas, but I, I don't have <laughs> fecking pumas. I don't have a rim shot. I don't have that. Sorry. Maybe next time. Maybe next time. Uh, you know, prop guy's no longer working for me. He quit, so I don't know what to do here. I can't do all this stuff myself. Anyway, I, I think that, that McLean is just, I mean, I, I, I liked him in the first book. Listening to this book, I literally came to this epiphany. At how great he was. I just listened to him like tell jokes and I would rewind and listen to him how he worded that. I said, my gosh, any other reader, other, any other narrator, and again, I'm not throwing out this against anybody else, would not have read it this way. They would have read it in this capacity. And it would have been funny because it was a funny line to start with. But the way he did it, the way that McLean did this, he nailed that joke down. Um, you know, I mean... He he just he just does a really good job joke but good job good joke. He, I don't know what my problem is today. It must be getting near Christmas. Actually, I'm gonna tell you the truth. Um, our vault company sent me over. And I'm not kidding. Like eight giant bags of these things. It came in in this thing, and it's it's popcorn. And I've eaten about a quarter of this bag of caramel popcorn. And I'm hyped up on sugar, so I can't think straight. But my point is, Rimmel is brilliant. I never heard a joke fall flat. And in fact, I firmly believe he made his work better in this book. Um, he elevated Rimmel's work better in this book. So all I gotta say is, McLean, I have my eye on you because if I do get to write one of my silly, stupid books that I want to write, I'm calling you up. And that's a promise because I'm just amazed at how well you did things. Now, just kind of give you a fleshed out, fully bit of the story. Uh, the town is still in trouble. They need to raise money and they need to pay the people in the town. And he is beset on all sides by different things. There's, there's goblins coming. There's other things coming. And poor Jim is right in the middle of having everything collapse in on him and he's going to lose the, the, the town itself. He won't be mayor. Um, he's got internal conflict. He's got external conflict. It's really good. Uh, and, and it's really paced well. I mean, like, I don't think it ever dragged a bit in this, this story at all. It was like, bam, 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 bam. And I think one of the best parts about the story was just, like I say, it gets silly. It gets goofy. Um, and I can't remember the wording of this. And I hate to. I'm not trying. I'm not going to spoil anything because it's it's just it's a good joke. But he he learns magic in this book, and his magic is like elemental air or something or other. But basically, it's it's fart magic, and um, he like, he ends up making things fart, and that's the extent of his ability. So you know he he makes like pumas. Um, <laughs> they got another one. Um, he makes the pumas fart. He makes the badger fart. He makes, and, and, and it is hilarious. It's it's just one of these funny things. And the whole time through the book, I kept thinking, this is going to be a very major power. And and didn't come to fruition the way I expected. So I'm thinking what I'm thinking was is going to probably happen in book three or four, because this is like one of those little seeds that gets planted as this is a joke now, but in four books, you're going to see this thing become a deadly weapon. So we'll see. Um, but I mean, the whole thing is just great. I love this book. I probably loved it more than the first book. And I have no complaints whatsoever about this. I mean, I really, really, really enjoyed this book. Um, I think you will too, especially if you're in a comedy. If you're not in the comedy, then you may want to step back a little bit because this is 
it, it is serious, but it is overly done in humor. And that is a great thing, because there are very few times today that you get to laugh. Um, and if you don't like to laugh, then you'll ha absolutely hate this book. If you love to laugh, this will be the most entertaining novel you can read all year. And, uh, you know, I'm just saying that because this, this book made me laugh from start to finish. Uh, final score, 8.3 stars. Rimmel and McLean riff off one another like Pryor and Wilder, like Money and Python, like Abbott and Costello. Uh, this is a duo that makes listening more fun than it has a right to be. Uh, oh, and and the fecking Pumas, they they really, they really made me laugh too. Uh, so you know, if you get a chance, pick up this book and just check it out because it, it's it's incredible. Oh, so Wargon's Mantle Underworld, book three, uh, by James Hunter and Aaron Crash. Uh, narrated by Armin Taylor, uh, with a book length of 14 hours and 38 minutes. I stopped. We still had about 15 minutes until the top of the hour, but something was moving in the pristine blue waters. Three big shadows were carving through the waves and ocean spray, heading straight toward us. Behind them, even more darkness spread through the sea like ink from an octopus. What? In the hell is that? I thought. Some kind of giant sea creature? No. That was an incoming army. The 2 p.m. attack would be starting early. I turned on the messaging system. I was loath to use it since it would alert Antiope to the fact that we knew the attack was on, but at this point, there was no other option. I hit every Amazon in the city. We have incoming enemies on the Western Ocean going for the beach. I need everyone up and at them. So, how do you say goodbye to an old friend? I mean, I, I, I don't. I don't ever say goodbye. I just kind of pretend that, that old friends of mine that are gone are still hanging out just down the road. Just They're only just hanging out around a corner, around a bend, just down the road. And I plan on doing that with this series because even though like the evil Knievel of writing, Mr. Aaron Crash and the master of lit RPG craft, James Hunter have left an opening for this book and, you know, continuation in the future. I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Uh, and you know, uh, I think Mr. Evil Knievel Crash here, uh, he, he, he enjoys the series, but he's also got like, enough going on that he can kind of let this one go for a bit and, and not worry about it. Um, I've been a fan of this book series since day one, and it's kind of funny how certain books remember, make me remember where I was when I first listened to them. Before the Completionist Chronicles, I was vacuuming the front porch of the funeral home uh, for War, War God 2. I was in the funeral home storage room uh, cleaning. Um, every time I start War God, I'm instantly transported back to that time that I was in that cleaning room. Just like when I listened to Completionist Chronicles, um, I'm on the front porch vacuuming. It, it just, it's, I don't know why I do that, but I can tell you, like, I started moving uh, uh, one of the couches off of the, out of the way so I could vacuum behind it when I was cleaning the porch for the Completionist Chronicles. <clears throat> I was actually sweeping the floor with the, you know, pan and broom uh, when I listened to the first War God. Uh, so, it, it always kind of transports me, and it only does that with certain kinds of books. So if, if I have that kind of a memory, I know it was a good book. <coughs> Excuse me. Anyway, uh, you know, this is that good book uh, that has just two flaws. Just two flaws that I could see. First, and my biggest complaint about this book is one I have that's very similar to the Percy Jackson series. And in that Jackson Jackson series... Everything had a deadline. Um, and if you, you know, you don't know what I'm talking about, like, I, I have to read um, books to my kids for years. I've read to them every single night up until the point they turn like 14 and 15, respectful, respectively. Uh, so it was only a couple of years back that I stopped reading books. And I'm actually starting back into it now with the two that we adopted. So I, I have to find books that I enjoy to read or that I know that it's, it's along the lines of this will draw them into stuff that I like to read. So, you know, my youngest son wanted to read Percy Jackson. 
And I don't hate Percy Jackson like I do Harry Potter. I loathe Harry Potter. I, I hate it. But Percy Jackson has this thing in his books where everything has a deadline. And, and if you, you know, you watch the movie, you'll see like Zeus is like, if I don't have my thunder back, thunderbolt back by um, midnight on Thursday on Mount Olympus, I'm going to destroy the world because I have to have my thunderbolt back. And the next book is, if you don't get this done by a certain time, this is what's going to happen. And, and I, I've kind of noticed that VGO and War God, the, the timer deadlines appear almost in every book now. Like, for example, in VGO, you get a lot of Death Heads uh, quests or whatever you want to call them, the Death Heads thing happening where you're on a timer and if you don't do it, you're going to die and it's going to be a horrible way to die. Um, you, know, you know, the Death Head quest, just that's it. Um, I get that you have to have like a, a sort of Damocles hanging over your character's heads. Um, all I ask is just mix it up a little bit. Um, and here it's the same thing. They have eight hours to get from point A to point Z and then do what they got to do to prevent things from happening any further. Uh, eight hours. And, and it just seems like it's a, it's a impetus to kind of feel like there's a pressure. And I, and as much as I love James and I, I, I love Aaron, um, I don't need that in, in all my books. I, I think that there's a lot of stuff that you can you can put in there instead of having that deadline hanging or looming in the distance. Because to me, a deadline is really not that scary. You know, because you know, honestly, honestly, you know they're always going to make their deadlines, no matter what it is. Deathhead's quest, they're going to make it. Um, Got to save the girl by three hours, they're going to make it. So deadlines don't really make me chew my fingernails or fret or worry because I know it's not, you know, it's going to happen. The threat of death, um, that's a whole other matter. Uh, and I get yeah, death head quest has that. And if you fail, you, you, you die, but you know, it's not going to, it's not going to happen to the main character. And I, I need more than that sometimes. So that that's part one uh, of my big, complaints about the book really my only complaint about the book but the second one if i have to give you one is there's a part where the team is going somewhere and there is fire everywhere and a lot of things that humanity has discarded as they made this trip they're just laying around and then one of those things was stacks of jim dresden's books you know the harry dresden books did I say Jim Hedred? Jim Butchers. See, you can tell I'm tired. Um, it's kicking in now. It's, it's I've been going for a long time now, and I'm probably on 17 hours now. Yeah, 17 hours of being awake, and it's been a long day, and it was exhausting, and I'm just getting this in. And this has been a really long week. Uh, last two weeks have been really busy, and I haven't had time to do this. So I'm recording a couple of things ahead of time now. I'm getting smarter as I get older. Um, but it's getting late and I'm getting tired. So forgive me. Um, anyway, the, the Jim Dresden, it's Jim Butcher, Jim Butcher and the Harry Dresden books. So there's a stack of Jim Butcher's Harry dress Dresden books that fall over into an inferno. And I had made a comment online. I said, not once was the line, the books were on fire and it wasn't my fault ever uttered. Alas and lack such wasted potential. Uh, and, and that's because in one of the Harry Dresden novels, um, Jim Butcher's first line was, the building was on fire and it wasn't my fault. And it's probably one of the most classic lines ever written. It goes right along with, in a hole in the ground there lived the Hobbit. And then it goes into, you know, it, it, was, it wasn't a wet hole and it wasn't this... Ugh, I never realized how nasty that sounds. But, but... Either way, there was a line there. I thought, damn, that was perfect for this. And they didn't do it. They didn't use it. So it was wasted potential. I was glad to see that the book defied expectations and did not prevent, provide a 100% happy ending for all the Amazons or the players that had been in this series. Uh, and that we were given some hope uh, for a new quest that could be spearheaded into another trilogy when the time comes, because there is, there's a lot of stuff that's given to it. But basically the, the gist of the story is 
is that, you know, our, our favorite airman is um, finally able to take the battle to the underworld. And I don't want to go much more into that. But he's got a timeline. He has to get there. If he's going to stop Hades, excuse me, he's got a certain amount of time he has to get it done. And this is it. And if he fails, is is he's pretty much screwed. Um, I really like the way the book ended, like I said, because not everything is perfect. I, I think that, um, you know, and, and they could have done they could have done a Mary Poppy Mary Poppins ending very easily here. Uh, they don't. They don't do that at all. And I enjoyed that more than anything um, because there were certain people that they could have had happier endings or come back or something. Those things don't happen, and it's and it kind of goes against expectations a lot, um, because you know most times, you know writers say, "Well, uh, I got to put this back here, put this back here, put this back here, and make everybody happy." Uh, no, they don't. It's not all pies and ice cream, and I hate pie. Just so you know. Um, so that's it. But but the battles are really really cool. I like how um, the war god um, finally kind of comes into his own. He struggles a lot uh, against his his war god nature, but he, you know, but he he ends up handling things differently. I think than than what Ares expected, um, and so you know, he he kind of grows. In a lot of new ways. And it was fun to see. And, you know, we get to meet a new goddess. And the Amazons kind of flesh out. So it was it was a nice trip uh, to see them take. And the battle was at the end was really cool. It was really good. So I, I enjoyed that a lot. The amazing Armin Taylor um, narrates this. He does his amazingly usual job. Um, Do I say amazing that much? I, I just... Listen to myself say it, and I, I probably said amazing eight times in this last sentence. I probably, um, but the guy has an incredible voice, and he really knows how to tell a story. And I can see why he got into this business. Um, Taylor is one of these people that um, I love to listen to, and it, it's just one of these things where um, he 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 just does such a good job every time he's up. That you know, I'm just like man. I know no matter what happens, the, the book is going to sound great. And it really does. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm having a hard time. I'm starting to dry, dry throat it now. Um, but Taylor does such a fine job with the characters. And if, if he had to have a weak spot, <laughs> and I hate to say it, but if, if, if Taylor has a weak spot, it's that um, his female voices <laughs> aren't a hundred percent perfect, <laughs> you know, but, and I, I think he knows that. I, I think that, uh, having all those Amazons probably was, was a struggle for him, um, to get through because, um, his lady's voices really maybe about three of them. He can get to that. It's not clear, um, that he's struggling a little bit, but after that, their voices kind of just kind of, they're very not girly. And um, even before, <laughs> they're really not that girly. Uh, you know, like you say, Jeff Hayes, he can pull off. Jeff Hayes can do women's voices like you can't believe. And Andrea Parsonow can do men's. So they're kind of like mirrors looking at each other. Whereas Armin just tells a really damn good story, does an incredible job. But his lady voices aren't exactly perfect. Uh, and that's okay. You know, not everybody can do it. Um, so he, he's really good. He's one of my favorite narrators. And if you listen to him at all, um, you, you would be, he, you know, he, he would be one of your favorites too. Um, CM Carney uses him for, um, his series. And I really, every time I, and I have a review coming up cause I've actually got it all written. I just haven't recorded it yet. Um, for CM, CM Carney's last book, um, he uses Armin Taylor too. And I often think to myself as I'm listening to it, this is a lot like VGO. There's a lot of stuff that just seems to me like this is a Viridian Gate book. This has Viridian Gate qualities to it. This has Viridian Gate feel. And 
I, I, I want to make sure it has nothing to do with Armin Taylor. Um, as much as it, you know, he, he narrates and how he talks, um, the similarities there, it's just a coincidence basically that Taylor narrates both series. Um, but he does narrate both series and he, he just, he does such a good job. And I, I loved him a lot with, with Annalise Rennie, uh, in radioactive evolution, you know, by Hummel, uh, just kills it, you know, just kills it. Um, Taylor is just an incredible guy all around. I love to listen to him. So, you know, just, I know you won't have a problem with it either. Um, my final score is 8.2 stars. It's a nice way to wrap things up. Although I definitely want more of the new, War God. I want to see, you know, right now he's just getting his footing. Um, and, you know, I hate to see like a character just get built up to where they need to. And then we walk away. We walk away. It's kind of like if you watch the movie Brightburn, Brightburn stops right where it really should have started. Like it should have started like the last half hour. A bright burn should have been the beginning of the movie and then going into him being psycho and doing stuff that would have worked a lot better and it would have been a cooler story. As much as I like bright burn, um, it had its issues. I just think that you know the story just should have started somewhere else and just continued onward. Um, here I need more, I you know, um, just getting the war god mantle under control and getting all the power that he gets, I, I think that, you know, I need to see more of this later on. So Aaron, James, if you're listening, please don't let this be the end. I hope the book is done well enough that you can justify doing another three books. You know, so it's up to you, but give it a thought. Well, folks, that's our show. Um, I hope you've had a very happy holiday or you're about to have a happy holiday. Anyway, uh, from the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. Take care.